channel, but you would like to join the Zoom call, what we do is we actually have a post-show Q&A. So once we uh, shut down the main session, anybody that's on the Zoom call with us can jump in and ask us questions directly. So if you want to jump on the live session with us, uh, you could do that. Uh, just go to govology.com uh, forward slash issues, and you'll see the little link to register for today's show. It's free. You can get in and come on and, and ask your questions here at the end. Also, I want to mention our uh, Gabology Nation. This is our private LinkedIn group. We have over 1,500 members there between uh, government contractors uh, like yourself, if you're in government contracting, but we also have a lot of our partners out there, our Apex Accelerator partners, our MBDA partners, uh, VBOX experts, uh, faculty members. We've got a really great group over there. So that's always also a, a great place to interact, ask some questions, and just keep updated on, on things that you need to be updated on. So the best way to get over to that LinkedIn group and join is just go to govology.com forward slash nation and request access and we'll get you in very quickly. Last but not least, uh, Michael set up a, a special page for those of you guys who are in the Gavology community, where he's got some uh, really neat uh, freebies for you there and some cool deals at federal-access.com forward slash Gavology. So that link's on the screen. And also, Michael, if you want to post that link in the chat as well, and the folks who are with us here on Zoom yeah. could just click on that if they want to Absolutely. hop over to that page. That might be an easy way to get there. So with that, I will conclude the housekeeping and say again, for those of you who just came in, welcome to another issues of Gov. I'm sorry, let me start over. Welcome to another episode of GovCon Coffee and Issues. And uh, let's go ahead and kick this thing off. So, Michael and Rich, thank you for joining us today. Uh, it's nice to have you, Rich. This is, uh, I know this is your first time on the show. So, uh, we're going to have some good questions for you here today. Thank you. And uh, today's topic, what we're going to be talking about, we actually had a submission. So, by the way, for those of you guys who don't know, uh, also, when you go to that page where we repost this uh, show, uh, there's a little link. So if you have any issues that you're dealing with, you can actually fill out a form and we can look at addressing those issues on this show because we don't want people to get stuck in the process. We want you to keep moving forward. And that's part of the purpose behind this podcast is that any issue that you got, let's get it addressed so that you can keep moving forward. So the one issue that we had was related to how to really get sales once you get your GSA schedule. And I love this request because I know that this is a big issue for a lot of contractors. And, uh, you know, I've seen the statistic out there that something like, you know, 52% of the businesses that you know, get on GSA federal supply schedules lose their contract within the first couple of years for the lack of meeting the minimum required sales activity. And that really is terrible because you, you do all this work to get in, which is not only time intensive, but there's also a cost element often that goes into all of this. Uh, of course, time is money. And so we wanted to talk about this today. And and, and Michael suggested that we reach out to, to Rich because Rich has some experience in this area. So, Rich, I'd love if you could just maybe start out by uh, introducing yourself to our community here and, and, and talk a little bit about, you know, uh, tell us a little bit about, you know, what you do in your company. And then also specifically, what has been your experience uh, with GSA, uh, helping contractors uh, get some business on GSA, uh, doing it yourself. So if you could just take a moment to give a, a little introduction, and we'll start there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I, I'm looking through the list, and I and I recognize the one name. Uh, shout outs to Sicily there. I know we've talked before. We met at the 8A conference. If I've met any of you else before, and I don't recognize your name, I'm apologies right now. Please reach out after and, and say hello. Um, always good to, to uh, see people again. Um, yes, so I've been working as a uh, government uh, government uh, contracting sales coach, sales consultant now for about eight years. I started in the um, government contracting area uh, about 20 years ago and worked 
specifically in the uh, in the V and with um, a prime contractor and uh, was successful in winning multiple uh, government contracts with the Department of Veterans Affairs. So uh, fast forward a couple years ago, I just noticed um, there was a big gap in the market that needed filling. There was plenty of people out there that would uh, profess to help people get their GSA schedule, but there really wasn't very much um, in the area of helping people win contracts on their GSA schedule. Uh, a lot of folks even in the area that helped people get their contracts, um, some people would be very hands-on and help them help people get their GSA schedule contract. Others would just basically tell, give them a list of to-dos and, and what they needed to get done. Um, I tried to fill both those areas in, so I helped, I've helped a, a dozen or so get their GSA schedule, but work very closely with the clients to do that. Help them do some of the heavy lifting that they're not used to because they don't have the experience in government contracting. Maybe they don't know how to do their price research. Maybe they don't know how to write a technical proposal. Um, maybe they don't know how to strategically decide which SINs they need to be on. Those are all things that I help my clients with. But then uh, the other thing I do before they even, I even agree to help them, they, they usually say, I need a GSA schedule. My, answer, my, my question is why? Why do you need a GSA schedule? Oh, because that's how you get government contracts. Maybe. If, if there are people buying what you sell using the GSA schedule right now. So that's the study that we go through first. Is it worth getting a GSA schedule? It might be worth it to get another contract vehicle like NASA Soup or Oasis or Alliant. We don't know until we actually dig in the data. And with uh, if uh, people have worked with the SAM data bank before, it's a little different than USA spending. I have not been able to find this data on USA spending, but if you use the SAM data bank, there is a field that tells us whether something or maybe not on SAM, but it was used open market. There's no contract, no scheduled contract or no uh, contract vehicle was used. But then if, the, if a contract vehicle has been used, there's a little number in there, usually somewhere between anywhere between nine and 16 digits. And those first six digits or maybe between five and seven digits tell us how was this bought? What contract was this bought on? And so we go through that study and see, okay, well, this makes sense. You know, let's go after a GSA schedule. But it also tells us who buys what we sell using the GSA schedule so we can put a marketing strategy together to help them um, sell once they get their GSA schedule. By the way, it's also very compelling when you turn something into a contracting officer, a GSA schedule contracting officer, to show them we already have a marketing plan, as opposed to, I don't know, well, isn't this the Amazon of, the gov of, of government sales? All we have to do is put our schedule in and so they're just gonna submit orders. So helping them with that understanding is where I help, is the gap that I think I've filled um, in the last few years. Awesome, man. Well, thank you for that introduction. So and I'm glad you, you mentioned the fact of the, the do you really need a schedule? Because I, I think that's unfortunately why we see a lot of people get into the schedules and they probably shouldn't have got one in the first place. And so uh, uh, I'm guessing that because of the topic today that we announced that, that most people may already have a schedule. And so they're looking to how to basically make use of that. Um, you know, I guess on one downside is like if you did some market research with a person and you saw it like, well, this is not really the place that you need to be. I, what would be your advice to somebody that's kind of like they've gone through the process, they've, they've got on the schedule and you know, you you did the market research with them after the fact, um, and if this is not the right place for them, what would be, what would be your advice to them? You know, do they just abandon the efforts there, let it expire, um, shift their focus into the different pathway? Do they try to salvage something out of 
um, a bad situation? So what what I there's there's I have one cl client that I'm thinking of in, uh, in specifically and what they do is is a is a real niche. I mean, it's the the platform that they work on is very niche. It's not very well known. Um, the people that do know it know it, but you know, I I would say in the last year, probably only ten of their ten of their um, there's only been ten buys on GSA <clears throat> for their product in mm -hmm. in the last year. So what I encourage them to do is start reaching out to the open market bids because there was there was a good there was a good number of open market bids last year using the platform that they that they um, that they supply and reaching out to them early and saying, look, we have a GSA schedule. Notice that your agency uses the GSA schedule for other things. Why not use it for this? And we also piggyback that with. Um, because they sell a certain platform software. I, this isn't the one, but let's just, I'm going to use Salesforce because everybody uses it. They sell the licenses for Salesforce and they sell custom solutions on the Salesforce. Mm. So they've used that selling the licenses as, a, as a, an entree to selling their services. Mm. Yeah. And, and no, there isn't, very, there isn't anybody else that's doing it, but giving, the, their, giving their customers that, flexibility has has turned out to be very positive for them and they're getting inquiries from multiple agencies on on their services now which is more lucrative than their software licenses to begin with so that's one that's one way i would put it just start responding to rfis for the services or products that you sell and say we're on gsa you know try to um influence that acquisition to go to towards gsa um, if they already use another contract vehicle, you can give it a shot, but yeah. most likely you're going to stick with that co other contract vehicle, whether it's NASA soup or CIO SP4 or, yeah. you know, no, that's great advice. I, I really love that. And, you know, so essentially to, to sum up what you just said uh, is that if they're seeing things coming out in the open market, which typically those are, if they're over 25 K, that's when you'll see those items hit Sam you're seeing those items hit SAM and you have a GSA schedule for those, uh, I think that then a little education of the contracting officer would be helpful so that they could put it back through GSA because technically speaking, they should be going through the GSA if there's contractors on schedule before they go out to open market, mm -hmm. you know, barring kind of any extenuating circumstances. Mm -hmm. right. it's, you, you have to continue to sell the schedule. Another example, a uh, contracting officer asked a client for market research. We gave him the market research. I think we even put our schedule number in there, but for whatever reason, it was ignored. So we followed up with that contracting officer, said, where is this in the, where is this in the uh, area of get, being put out to bid? Well, I'm still doing my work. I, you know, um, I, I have to get this done. I have to get that done. I said, have you thought about using a GSA schedule or GSA schedule? Oh, I didn't know you had a GSA schedule. Yeah. We, well, we had it. It was in there, but okay. All right. Yeah, we do have a GSA schedule. Yeah. Well, but you don't have a, you don't have a, uh, you don't have any competitors on GSA. Well, no, we don't have competitors for the act, the same brand, brand name, but there's equals out there. You have to be willing to expose your competition a little bit. If you know that you can stand up against your competition, it's very powerful because you could say, well, there's two or three other people that do it on GSA and do the market research for them. Hand them, you know, lead them to the water, lead them to the water. And that strategy has been helpful too to sell the GSA schedule. Because I'm going to tell you, I'd much rather have a GSA schedule bid where you have two or three people bidding on it because there just isn't as much competition than go open market and have 20 people bid on the same. Absolutely. You know, mm -hmm. and usually the people with the GSA schedule are a little more savvy. They're not going to, they're not going to accept a 1% margin just to win a contract. Where in the open market, it's the wild west. We just right. don't know. You don't know who you're going up against. You have that person that just wants to win that first contract and they will do anything to do it, including marking up a half a percent. So 
that's why we always try to we try to steer them to our to our GSA schedule. It's rarely lucrative for us not to. Right. Absolutely. Now those are great tips, man. And uh, I I 100% agree with everything you just said. And uh, you know, one thing I'll piggyback on with regards to the competition under under the the uh, FAR for GSA. One of the suggestions I was going to make uh, for those who gotten their schedule if they haven't already done this is just to read far part eight in its entirety you google far part eight it'll bring right up acquisition.gov but that sets forth the procedures that all contracting officers are supposed to follow or they shall follow which is set by law in terms of ordering from gsa and it'll specifically state in there and what is kind of eye-opening here is is that they can go up to the simplified acquisition threshold, which is $250,000, and just basically survey three contractors out of, you know, however many is on the schedule. Uh, they they can say, hey, we're going to compete this to everybody. Um, but they can also just survey three, which means that, like, for example, if you're buying off of Amazon and you're required to survey three companies, okay, you look at three products and compare them and you make a decision. That's all that there is sometimes in that uh, solicitation process. We'll talk more about that, you know, and I want to talk just from some of those perspective of really knowing the rules of engagement and then the people who you are engaging with, I think is it's really important. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I love all the points that you just brought up. Michael, what are you seeing on this? Do you have some clients that are finding some success in GSA and some special, some certain things that they're doing to, to be able to maybe stand out uh, or to kind of, like Rich mentioned, influence the acquisition? Yeah, I, I think getting in early and talking to customers is probably one of the most important things that most people ignore. You know, I always tell people, just because you have a schedule doesn't mean you shouldn't talk to customers. In fact, just like Rich said, even in an RFP scenario or an RFI scenario where there's a place for them to put that in there, they don't necessarily read it. So that's a great just reminder right out of the gate there that just because you wrote it down doesn't mean they read it, doesn't mean they understood it, doesn't mean they care. Um, there's a lot of things, you know, kind of going against you by, when you're that far in the acquisition process. So when I'm talking to clients, I'm always saying, look, you should only spend about 15 to 20% of your marketing BD time on things that are in acquisition mode. So mm -hmm. it's actually an RFP, RFQ or whatever. You should be spending the other 75, 80% or more of your BD efforts talking to people that don't have something on the street. So it, there isn't an RFP, there isn't an RFI, there isn't an anything, you know, where you, you've gone, you've done some homework, you've looked at the data that Rich is talking about and said, okay, these 25 contracting officers buy what I sell. They're at the agencies I want to target. I need capability briefs with these folks. I need conversations with them and their small business people. That's where you can have those conversations in position. You know, hey, Rich, you've got a, an opportunity to solve a problem here. It's a $200,000 opportunity. You know, that's a great one to, to go through GSA. Have you thought of using GS, GSA to solve that small problem before we go on to the next, the bigger problem and things like that to get some traction and some past performance with an agency. And so those are really, really simple types of opportunities. You know, an opportunity that big meets your goal for the year, even if it's 25K, meets your goal for the year. So now you've got your goal met and you can think more strategically about what you're doing. I also look at GSA as when I'm doing the research, it's not always about, you know, will I sell millions of dollars on the schedule but will I be able to open some doors? Like Rich was saying, they were using the, the one, the licensing as the entree, and then they were coming back with the services. So maybe they come in and they're only selling $25,000, $100,000 a year through GSA technically, 
but where they're really making their money is on the back end servicing the stuff they sold on GSA. So when I when you think about GSA, don't just necessarily think about it as this is the end all be all. I'm going to funnel everything in my business through this. It's one tool in your tool bag. And so based on your customer set, you can decide how you use that tool and how often. You may use it at every customer, you may use it at one out of five. Um, it may, you know, it just it varies based on how people are buying what you sell and what else you sell. Again, in his case, they were selling a license, but they're also selling services. And they probably want to sell a lot of licenses, but they also want to sell a lot of services, you know, and those services are probably more lucrative, higher profit margin. So they may only want to sell two, three hundred thousand dollars a year in licenses, but they may want to sell five million dollars a year in services. That five million dollars not going to show up on GSA. It's just probably not. That's not how that it's going to be bought. But it, but the GSA is a vehicle to get them in there to make it happen. And so if you if you think of it as a tool instead of just the end all be all, I think it makes using it a little bit easier and it's it's easier to digest. You know the money you may have to spend, the time you have to spend to get it. Um, but then you also may need others. So don't just think of it again, as I just need GSA, you may need three vehicles. You may need four vehicles, whatever it may be in order to fully service your client base that's out there. So, so those, those are my two cents. All right, Rich, what do you think about Michael's two cents there? He thinks I'm crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, that's, that's very true. It is, it's a way to open doors. And a lot of times it's, you know, is it chicken or is it egg? some people think, well, I need to get the GSA schedule so I can start selling to these people. I say start selling and then, you know, you're selling solutions, you're selling, you know, you're, and then um, you go, I don't know how we can do this. We don't, you know, we don't have, you know, we're supposed to use this contract. We're supposed to use a contract vehicles. Oh, well, we do have, we do have a GSA schedule. Or we have a partner that has a has the contract vehicle. I'm 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 not going to go off in too much of a tangent with this, but you know it's it's strategically being there for your customer when it needs to be, as opposed to getting the GSA schedule and then go find the customers. That approach is okay. I'm not saying there's a problem with it, but I personally would say don't wait till you get your fill in the blank GSA schedule, um, socioeconomic set aside, um, 8A. Um, 8A business development um, uh, uh, certificate. Don't wait, start. Because then as you get those things, those are just other tools you can put in your in your toolbox and then you can get them out. Oh yeah, well we have a GSA schedule. Um, it, it's just another way of looking at, at what it does. It's, it's a tool. It's, mm -hmm. it's just, an, it's another way. It's another door opener as Mike said. Yeah. Yeah, and we, we're always telling clients, look, if you know your GSA is coming, which, you know, over the last decade, I went from telling people it was going to take six months to get their GSA schedule to saying, I don't, I think Jesus may come back before you get it. You know, like you just never, it's net, we don't know. It's going to take so long, right? Because at one point it was taking almost two years for some people. All of a sudden, GSA about a year or so ago got the time down. It was taking six months again. I just talked to a client yesterday and she's like, Mike, it's been over a year. So you don't really know how long it's going to take to get your GSA schedule, which is another factor. Um, it could be six months. It could be a year. Uh, I know there's that springboard GSA, which is supposed to be a lot faster to get. Um, but even then, you know, you just don't know how long the process is going to take. Even submitting your GSA schedule, we've got a guy that does that on our team. I think he's one of the best in the business. He's super fast at it. Um, he's been doing that for our clients for over a decade. He's really reasonable. And yet, a lot of times when people come to him, he's like, Mike, I can have this thing out the door in 30 days, but they won't get me this information. I'm asking for this. I'm asking for that. I can't get the information. So on, on just the submission piece, I've seen it take six, eight months, a year for somebody to gather all their documents because they, they're running a business. So you know, you, if you're going to go in and do GSA and get it submitted, you have to understand how long that wait time is and get all your ducks in a row, make it a priority, have the time to do it. Um, because the faster you get it submitted, 
the faster it can start working in the government machine to come out um, because we just don't know how long it's going to take. So, so take that into consideration. Um, when it comes to, to doing your GSA schedule, you can do it by yourself. Um, Cause I, I know there's people in here that don't have one yet. Mark is one of those. He's got questions about it. So uh, I'll just speak to this real quick. You can do it yourself. However, a lot of people pay an expert to do it because there's so much to do in, in the process. I've seen that range anywhere from about $6,500 to $40,000 and up for people to do. I think, I think the anything over about eight or $9,000 to me, unless you've got millions of products and it's really complicated, complicated is just way too much money. Um, and so, you know, again, money, time, those are factors you need to think about in addition to does my customer buy on this? How are they going to buy on it? Um, but once you get all that going, you can start, as Rich said, starting to tell people, are, are, we've been submitted. This is coming. Don't know exactly when. You could start positioning when you're having those conversations with people and you just keep talking to them about it and, until you have your schedule. So, mm -hmm. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and you know, what I also like about what you said, Rich, is just kind of get started in doing the reach out. You know, I think a lot about the fact that like any business that's doing business out there today, non-government world, right? It's like, you've got a process usually, right? You got a sales process. You've got a defined product to offer. You work the process with your validated product that sells and you make sales. But typically that process involves reaching out to people, you know, getting in front of them, you know, getting your, your, your products positioned in front of them. And I think that there, <clears throat> there's this notion that with government, it's a completely different animal. And the, the thing is to do is just basically register at SAM, maybe get a GSA if that's what your market research tells you. By the way, don't just buy somebody's, you know, services to put you on schedule because they called you up and told you you should do that. You know, there's a lot of companies out there that are, are doing that. And uh, I think that that's probably part of the reason why we have this problem with 52% of businesses getting kicked out of schedules because they probably shouldn't have got it in the first place. So just be cautious about that. Uh, do your homework on that. If you're working with an apex accelerator out there, make sure you're talking to them to see, Hey, can you help me understand if GSA is uh, the right pathway to, to go for me? Work with a consultant uh, to do some market research, whatever you have to do, but that price that you're going to pay up front is going to be a lot less than the cost you're going to pay down the road if you do all of that work, and then you find that that's not the right place to be. So I can't really say enough about the market research, but kind of coming back to my point here is that, uh, you know, I think the, the market seems that most contractors feel like everything's kind of done the, through the computer where it's like, hey, yo, I'm going to wait for the bid. I'm going to wait for the bid. And there's a problem with this. And they said they don't they don't work their process that probably was working for them in the commercial marketplace when they should be using that same process, the same methods of reaching out to their end customers, to the buyers, to have conversations, to engage with them. And that's going to really help them in a few ways when they start to, you know, if they are on GSA schedules, you know, they can actually, you know, maybe be known and, and, and have a buyer specifically look to them and reach out to them. It really is telling. And what I see is one of the big problems for government contractors, both in open market and inside of GSA schedules, is that if you don't understand the way that the procurements happen, and that's why I mentioned earlier, go and read FAR Part 8. But just because you're on GSA schedule, you mentioned earlier, Rich, that like some people think that that's going to automatically get them contracts, well, which we know it's false. But not only does getting a GSA schedule not only not going to get you contracts automatically, but it doesn't guarantee that you're even going to be getting a solicitation. Because if you go back and read FAR Part 8, there's a lot of buying activity that happens when either the, the contracting officer can simply say, hey, I'm going to look at three companies and I'm going to call it good and I'm going to pick one. 
So if you're one out of a hundred on a schedule, how do you know that you're going to be the one of the three that the contracting officer is going to reach out to? So that's why I believe that being able to talk to the contracting officer that you know does the buys for the types of stuff that you sell is great. Uh, ask them, hey, how do you make a determination? Can you ensure that I, I get a quote? I'd love to be included on every uh, quote that you send out and, and vice versa. If you're doing your outreach efforts to your end customers, and that's not the, the buyers, contracting officers, that's the people inside of the agencies, your end users, your program managers, your department heads, whoever, if you're selling in the commercial marketplace that, that your target avatar typically is to start to facilitate the conversation, that's another great person to reach out to because they can do a few things for you. They can maybe request when they send the uh, requisition forth to contracting to get purchased, to let the contracting officer know that they maybe received a preliminary quote from you and they would like to make sure that you, uh, the contracting officer send you the RFQ. Um, and there's a few other ways that that can be beneficial, but that's where I tell people all the time to just work your process that works for you outside of the government marketplace. And there's primarily three differences in the government marketplace outside of the commercial world that you need to be aware of. One is the location of where you position your products. Specifically here within GSA schedules, I call that a location. It's a contract vehicle. So if you know that the volume's coming through there, you got to get in the GSA marketplace, that's what you do. The second piece is the compliance elements. So you'll need to understand the compliance elements unique to the government and make sure you're complying with those. And then the third thing is the paperwork. So just kind of getting that paperwork done and for the GSA schedule, that's number one, getting on the schedule. And then number two, being able to receive you know, a, a quote and then complete the quote. And then from there, just do your best job in, in, in being the best value contractor and, and, and trying to understand how you measure up against the other contract holders that are on your schedule. You can go to the GSA library. You can go to the GSA Advantage website. You can look at other people's price lists. You can start to look at all of these factors. And by the way, in FAR Part 8, which I mentioned that everybody read, there's also some other language that says additional items that the contracting officer shall consider when determining best values, things like warranty and, and those things. So make sure it really you got the best value then when you are lucky enough to be solicited as one of maybe three vendors. And I used to be in contracting. I didn't buy off of GSA, but I had friends that did. And I knew friends that basically just did the minimum three quotes and some that actually like to put the competition out to everybody. Uh, and then there's thresholds that says different things. So again, understand what those mean, connect in. And uh, that's really my two cents there. So uh, Rich, what, what are you seeing in all of this? And um, you know, what are we leaving out here? <laughs> well, um, you brought up a good point and that's, this is, this is not really GSA, but it's just, this is a soapbox I get on. And I don't think I'm the only one that does people that decide to skip the RFI, you know, they decide to, they decide not to submit the RFI. I'll wait till the bid comes out. And your point about GSA schedules is very well taken, especially in the context of GSA, because if we, if, if I were to respond to an RFI, decide to respond to an RFI, say we have a GSA schedule, we know two others that also sell on GSA, we think that this is best as a GSA schedule bid. And then next thing you know, it isn't even coming out on eBuy. It's emailed to me and I, maybe others, maybe not. It maybe they, maybe they have the impression that other people are being emailed, but you know, we're emailed, we submit and we win. That's been a great tactic that we've used with that same client I talked about earlier with the software licenses. We reached out to every open market per that bought it on open market and said, we think this is best suited for GSA. Where's one other person that also did this on GSA? We're the lowest price. We don't think you can get this lower anywhere else. 
And next thing you know, we're not even, it, I think we've, we've submitted, we've been successful in winning probably five bids on GSA since they've got it. Only one came out on eBuy. Mm-hmm. If, and by the way, eBuy, for people who don't know what eBuy is, eBuy is the special portal that GSA only bids come out on. So it's like the SAM for GS, it's like the, where you know you, people go to SAM for open market solicitations. eBuy is where, where GSA schedule holders go to bid on um, RFQs, RFPs. Yeah, and what I would encourage, and I, and I don't wanna be the dead horse here, but going back to telling folks to read FAR part eight, look at the language there, look at, what's at the contracting officer's discretion to basically only use three quotes and think about the fact that it doesn't state anywhere that they have to go out to all the vendors. Even when the competitions go above the simplified acquisition threshold of $250,000, basically it says to the extent practicable, you know, and over that amount, they say, you know, just make sure you're getting three quotes at least, you know? So it's like, again, if you, there's a hundred vendors on the schedule, uh, you know, what does it take to get three quotes? Maybe five RFQs uh, out to email to people, you know? So mm-hmm. again, it's, it's I, I feel that like people miss a lot of opportunity just because they never see it happen and they're not in the conversation. So they're not in the game. Yeah. You know, I one thing I would add to this is, it's really complicated being a business owner. Like it, it's really complicated. And when you throw in being a business owner, trying to learn the government market, then trying to learn nuances like GSA or other contract vehicles, or even how to speak to these people, even just the RFP process, it's so different than the way a lot of people sell commercially. Commercially, you know, you're doing these quotes. It is the way it is. And you just, you run through volume over here on the government side. There's so much strategy and so many different tools that I think people miss out when they just show up to a webinar like this, or listen to a couple of podcasts, let's, you know, pick up a book on it. They miss out because when you look at your business, you really need a custom strategy for it. And so this is my pitch to everybody on here. If you are frustrated with what's going on with your GSA schedule, reach out to Rich and talk to him. Because you've seen in just the 40 minutes we've been on here, like just the little nuances that most people are never going to think about. Those are the ones we've talked about in 40 minutes. There's probably two or three dozen others. So, you know, it doesn't cost you anything to reach out to somebody like Rich and say, hey, given what we sell, who we're targeting, what are some custom strategies we should be thinking about? Because, you know, you may not need a screwdriver or a hammer. You may need a wrench to do what you're doing. You may need a different tool in your tool bag to make your GSA schedule work. Or you may need to know what to say in some of those. And so I can't stress enough how important it is to reach out, talk to an expert, even if you never engage them with a contract, to just talk to them and see for your business, for your challenges, what are some steps I should be taking to use this thing properly? Um, Because we are talking at, at a high level, generalities, this is what you should do, but there's so many little pieces to finesse along the way that I think that's where people get lost and frustrated. Because again, if, if you're a business owner and you're one of the people on here today, you're thinking about payroll, you're thinking about contract, you're thinking about insurance, you're thinking about all these other things. And now you've got to throw this in there. It's like trying to learn a whole new thing. So don't beat yourself up, bring in an expert to have a chat with. I mean, I talk with experts all the time that I don't necessarily engage. So it doesn't necessarily cost you anything. And if it makes sense, then you, you, you work with them. That's, that's why we're all here to help you. Um, but this is just one of those little intricate things about government contracting that really requires help. And I think a lot of people don't want to ask for help. So that's my soapbox for today yeah. on this one. And I would um, say too, good help is hard to find as well that's true that's true because <laughs> especially in this of, market you know yeah. it's, it's very difficult so it's like 
it's definitely I feel like the the market for people that sell services out there to small businesses and others it's really like a, a red ocean really it's like yeah. a shark infested red ocean yeah and I again I caution people just to be careful when you get that call don't let people bring you into that realm if you didn't do your research first if they're not going to do the research with you first well I, you bring up a really good point real quick here yeah. most people don't know why they get the call they don't know why they get the call and they get spammed a hundred times for gsa services and certification services and all that a few months ago sam actually took that capability away from a lot of the marketers, but there's still databases running around that you used to be able to just download the spreadsheet with every single person in Sam, their phone number, email address, everything. It was all in the clear. And just in the last six months to a year, Sam pulled the email addresses out and some of the other contact information. So we're seeing less of that in the market. But before that, all you had to do was go on Sam. You didn't have to log in or anything. You download a spreadsheet. If you were good, you could connect your database to that one. And then you could actually just tie it in and it would automatically look in and say, oh, here's Carol. Here's Carol's cage code, his Dunn's number, his primary NAICS code, all that stuff. So we're going to send an email to, to Carol that says, Carol, you're missing out on billions of dollars in government yeah. contracts that are coming out on GSA and NAICS code, whatever in this sin. And, you know, so it looked like they had pulled data, done research, and it looked really official when yeah. all it was, was a database connection that was filling in some predefined fields and spitting out emails all day long. And that's what was happening to a lot of people. They, they're still doing it based on the old data. Uh, so if you're still getting those emails, that could be why. But uh, but that's that's really why people were getting that information. They'd done no research on you. They were just you know broadcasting those emails yeah. and spamming people. So. Yeah, phishing, government market phishing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just tell people if it's in the, if it, if if anything that they get from those those emails says dot com. Yeah, it's not legit. That's a trick. Watch. Look not, at the email. Look at the com. email extension. Yeah, or any other dot gov. If it's not dot gov or dot mil. Be careful because, yeah. and there's they're deceptive out there too. They'll make it look like they're from the government and they uh, they want to help. But my my favorite one is Carol. Your SAM profile is not complete. The only reason they have your email is because you've completed your SAM profile. That's right. <laughs> but if you pay us a thousand ninety nine dollars, we'll complete it and you'll start winning government contracts. Yeah. No one's ever won a contract by having a complete SAM profile that I know of. Right, right. Yeah, I, I always tell people, I say, well, what do I need to win a government contract? Well, technically, the minimum is a SAM profile. Yeah. But I've yet to see somebody who set up a SAM profile and got a phone call wanting a, you know, wanting them to sign a contract. Yeah, I've just never so, seen it. So. Yeah. No, yeah. me neither. Well, I think that we hit a lot of good points, uh, a lot of great points. And uh Rich, uh, I'll give you like the final words if you have any last thoughts uh, departing it here and we'll we'll close down this session and then we'll shift over to the, the Q&A for those who are on the Zoom with us. And, and again, for those of you guys who joined us late, if you want to jump into the, the post-show Zoom Q&A, you can do that by going to govology.com forward slash issues and just sign up for the Zoom call and jump in there with us. Okay, thank you. So. Um, I'll, I'll say the same thing I say as to my coaching clients, it all starts with who buys what you sell, whether, you know, whether we're putting together a strategy for them to win, or you're trying to figure out if a GSA schedule or another contract vehicle works for you, or, or, uh, even if, if government sales is even something you should look at period, who buys what you sell and how do they buy it? That's where it all starts. And, you know, there's, there are tools out there that you can do some of this on your own. There's USA Spending. There's the SAM Data Bank. Um, I, I think even FPDS.gov is still in, still in, uh, still working. I think today, as mm -hmm. of today, it's still For working. Now, yeah. yeah. So until they, until it's not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then there's there's more DIY stuff that we have available on um, on Federal Access. Our our uh, 
our portal that has strategy guides and there's a you know, there's a strategy guide on how to do your own SAM data, data bank pool pull. Um, you can work with people like me and Mike and, and there's others out there, not just us, um, that you can work with and they'll help you figure out who buys what you sell. Um, so there's 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 opportunities available. I just think you have you have to get deeper than these generic, oh, this snakes code had two billion dollars last year. Well, that NAICS code holds a lot of stuff. We need to get, we need to drill down better than that. We probably even need to use keywords when we're finding out who buys what you sell. So that's really my last word. It all starts with who buys what you sell. It tells you, do they use the GSA schedule? It tells you who's buying what you sell, how they're buying it. Um, sometimes it's important to find out when they're buying it. That's pretty much my last word. Awesome. Thank you so much. And, you know, I usually like to do a little recap and summary, but we shared so many great points today. And I really believe that if you're having an issue making sales on GSA schedules, uh, your answers are somewhere in what we just talked about. So I would encourage you just to go back through. We're going to have this recording available at that same location where you guys who are on the Zoom call with us came to register Gavology.com forward slash issues. We'll get this uh, uh, uploaded there in about a week. Again, we're also on the popular podcasting channels. If you look for us, just GovCon Coffee and Issues. Uh, you might want to watch this again. Uh, think about what we say here and take some action on those things. Maybe share that with some members of your team. Uh, if you've got a, a BD or a salesperson and you guys are needing to get out there and make some sales happen. So, uh, thank you so much, Rich, for joining us. Again, Michael, thank you, as always, uh, for being such a great co-host. And uh, with that, we'll see you next month, where I'll actually have uh, a nice revamped office. Uh, I can't let Michael show me up anymore, but I did break out my little eagle here, so I could have something. <laughs> so, But yeah, next month, we're going to have a, a new uh, office set up, so I'm excited all about that. But until then, we'll see you. Thank you for joining us. For those of you guys who are on the Zoom call, we'll go to the Q&A session now. So I'm going to pop up the chat, but uh, we're going to read a few questions. And actually, Michael, can you help me out with the, the chat Q&A? Uh, pop that up and see if we got any good questions there. But another way you could ask questions, if, we, if you just want to raise your hand and come on and ask us live, we can have a little chat like that. We can unmute your mic and uh, go from there. So, by the way, one more thing. If there's something that we didn't mention and you guys have some strategies, please share them with the group as well. We you know I know there's a lot of smart people on the call here today. So, yeah. what we got, Michael? I think one of the first question was from Mark. I think we answered that pretty thoroughly about maybe you don't need a, a, a GSA schedule. Um, Sharon asks, how do you access eBuy? So she had a question about that. So, um, so the best way to access eBuy is, well, number one, you have to have a GSA schedule to be able to access the eBuy. You can't look at eBuy bids to see, you can't look at eBuy bids unless you have a GSA schedule. So that's first. Second, you go to eBuy.gsa.gov if you do have a GSA schedule and you use your login uh, same one you used for uh, submitting your GSA schedule through eOffer. That's usually how you would uh, get on to eBuy. But also with eBuy, you are only going to see the bids for the SINs that you have a contract for. So if you have a contract to provide general management consulting services, which is 541611, you will only see 541611 bids. You will not see 54151S, which is uh, custom software development. You will not see those bids. So it's not the same as Sam, where you can see anything you want to see. You're only going to see the ones that you're subscribed to. Yep. Nope. Good answer there. Then uh, Gail asked about, is it correct to think of four general paths to initial success in getting a GSA schedule off the ground? Path one, your market research. Path two, SAM.gov, current solicitations. Path three, outreach and path for respond RFIs and sources sought. I think that you covered quite a bit of it there, Gail, in, uh, in there, just kind of listening to us there. And, you know, the, the thing about each one of those paths that you describe 
is based on say path one with your market research, that will guide you down some different areas as well. So uh, when I'm doing research, I kind of like to look at a little bit of everything. And as I pull it up, I'll be like, oh, well, there's this nugget in this section and it's going to lead me to go look somewhere else or go look at something else or maybe go look at somebody else's schedule and see how they're doing with sales. You know, that's something we didn't really talk a lot about is you can pull up somebody else's schedule in the in the e-library and you can see, well, how much did Rich sell on GSA on his schedule if Rich has a schedule? You know, so you may have some competitors that are like, man, GSA is just amazing. You pull it up and you're like, well, your version of amazing and mine are two very different things because, you know, a million dollars over the last 10 years is not a lot of money, you know, and uh, but uh, but looking at your competitors is often a really great way just pulling up their schedules and seeing are they actually selling on this? Or is it big fat goose eggs? Um, And then while you're in that database, while you're in Sam looking at stuff, you can go and pull up your competitors and look at just where are they actually making their money? Because they may say GSA, but, you know, that may be 5% of their sales. The other 95 may be on NASA Soup or Oasis or a combination of those things, or maybe half of it's open market. So you can very quickly sort out the noise by looking in the market research phase in SAM.gov and USA Spending. I kind of bounce between the two going back and forth, pulling my reports um, to figure out if it makes sense and then who you should target. So um, so good questions there from Gail. Rich or Carol, did you have anything to add to that? You know, I think that one tool that uh, I'd also like to make mention of, uh, in addition, uh, we talked about USA Spending and the SAM Data Bank as as good resources, which they are. But uh, the GSA uh, also has uh, a sales query tool, and they've got some reports. I just posted Mm -hmm. the link here for those of you guys who want to uh, click on that link and check out that website, maybe bookmark it. If I were actually selling on GSA schedules, I would definitely be learning these um, research tools to see for the schedule that I'm in, you know, where are the sales going there and what does that look like and and who's getting the sales. And and because if you're sitting out there and basically you go through a year seeing like nothing come your way in terms of RFQs, just remember you know, again, the agency is not required to solicit to everybody on that list, even if you've got the contract. So maybe you're missing the sales. And this is one way where you can actually see the activity that you're not being included in uh, and, and maybe figure out a way to get yourself included in that. One other thing that I actually popped into my mind that I wanted to mention, there's a clause in FAR Part 8, which I mentioned a couple of times during the show. Uh, And it's only, I think, uh, oversimplified acquisition thresholds on opportunities that require a statement of work. If that's the case, there's a a, a clause that says the contracting officer shall provide a copy of the RFQ to any contractee or contractor that requests it. So it's not found in the other parts. So is it relevant? Uh, you know, what I would do is I would also make it a best practice that if I knew that there was something coming out, if I got word, if I had communications in with folks or I, I knew other vendors are on the schedule and they receive something, um, I, I would definitely request that uh, the contracting officer, you know, forward an RFQ to me. I might even try to do a blanket request to say, hey, you know, uh, this is who we are. This is our schedule. Uh, I would like to just formally request, you know, that we get uh, a copy of all RFQs related to these products. Uh, It's worth a shot. You know, everything may help. Uh, It might not work, but uh, I would just, again, uh, use those tools to your advantage and then just think about the rules of engagement and how you can get yourself to be included in those acquisition competitions. Good stuff. Rich? Um, Carol, I'm going to have a hard ahead. stop here in a couple of minutes. Just okay. a heads up for you uh, so you can field questions after I'm done. Um, there's an, another question here from Juan. It's, can you elaborate more on Oasis and the agency behind it? I don't know if anybody wants to talk Oasis. We're actually getting into Oasis Plus 
uh, now, which I think that RFP is on the street right now, due in September maybe. Um, so, anybody want to talk about Oasis for a minute? Go ahead, Rich. You're on mute, by the way. Rich, you're on mute still. Yeah, thank you. Right. Um, so I, um, Oasis, it's also managed by GSA. Um, it's used for professional services. Um, there, it's a different contract. There are other nuances nuances to it. I don't know exactly what all those are because I haven't read the, especially the new Oasis Plus RF, RFP. Um, but I also know too that this is this is different than a GSA schedule. With GSA schedule, you can basically go out anytime and start your, the process of getting on as a multiple uh, on the multiple award schedule. Oasis, they have an on-ramping period and they'll have a period of about five years and then that will go away and then you'll get another chance to on-ramp again. But you can't just, you just can't go submit um, uh, an app, uh, 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 submit a proposal for Oasis in the middle of an Oasis um, contract period. That's a big difference between that and um, GSA. There's other, other probably differences, but I, I can't speak to those. Mm -hmm. Um, but I do know, I mean, again, this is, this is contract vehicle agnostic. I mean, you, whether you're looking to who buys what you sell on GSA or Oasis, all you're looking for is a different first six digits of that reference IDV code. Mm -hmm. So that's what you're, that's what tells the difference. Yeah. And it all ties back to an agency. Yeah. The, the only point I'll make about Oasis here is whether it's Oasis or anything else, don't go out and collect these vehicles like baseball cards. Right. That, that's the mistake that most people make. I will pull up a website. They've got 18 contract vehicles and $500,000 in revenue over the last five years. And I'm like, so you're collecting contract vehicles, but you're not doing anything with them. So you've got to be able to convert contract vehicles into contracts. And you have to understand that that goes back to the market research. Am I getting on the right contract vehicles for my audience that I want to focus on? And am I doing the work after that, whether it's responding to task orders or whatever it may be, am I marketing it properly? And if you're not, you're not going to win. So just having a collection of these doesn't guarantee you anything. They're just vehicles the government can use to purchase from you if everything else lines up with your strategy there. So with that, Carol, I've got to hop off, get on another call. Uh, right. you're, uh, Rich, you're in great hands with Carol or Carol. Right. You're well, in great actually, hands I got a two o'clock also. <laughs> so, okay. Then, then, yeah, then, so, got, so what I'd like to do in the chat before I leave, I'd like to put out my, uh, I'm just going to put out my calendar. If anybody wants to schedule a strategy That's session with it. me, um, uh, feel free to feel free to get on my calendar and we can discuss your specific scenario. And, and if it makes sense, maybe we can work together. Perfect. All righty. And that's right. a wrap. Thank you so much. Rich. Thank, thanks, Michael. Right. Thanks, thanks, everybody next month. Thanks, Elena. Next month, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.